This one's going to be a little different. I mean, it does stand on the pillars of what usually goes on here, miniatures and occasionally books, but the nature of things to come is somewhat of an experiment. Also a tribute to the fact that indulging in a hobby can lead to surprising knowledge. A tribute, if you may, to the fact that what we do a lot of the time when indulging in our hobby is unintentionally learning a craft. Some friends of mine, Kollektivet Livet, one of them being Alex, a lovely name that, the very same man that designed the great logo for this very channel, contacted me regarding an assignment they were working on. A campaign envisioned to celebrate the existence of public libraries, something that has not actually been around all that long in the grand scheme of things, but also bringing awareness to the apparent fact that people in general are reading less and less. The mission was to place a hundred small libraries from the southernmost point of Sweden all the way up north, filled with books that people could grab, borrow, replace, and ultimately encourage the reading of books. Small cupboard-style libraries placed on electrical boxes, such as this one. A few of these small libraries were going to be so-called heroes, shaped as local, famous buildings. One of the heroes for Stockholm was to be shaped like the Stockholm Library, a great library and a lovely piece of architecture. To make it that extra bit special, wouldn't it be cool if there was an actual miniature library inside that resembles the interior of the real thing? And enter stage left, the miniature painter who likes to paint little fantasy warriors and aliens and that. Hi. Also, this miniature painter is a little perplexed. The box itself, shaped like the library, that in turn will hold the books and the miniature library will only be in my hand for two days. Then it needs to be, well, completed, sent back and ultimately placed at its final and very public destination. Also, it needs to be said, although rather boring, that there is a budget. Not perhaps symbolic, but rather limited budget. A budget that materials, sort of taken into account, would mirror the two days I would have with this box. And I guess, as with commission painting, although not a very commercial venture, budget needs to reflect the outcome. Even though I would only have the actual box for two days, I had been given some magic numbers. 19 times 15 times 102. And so, about a week in advance, I started to rev up my 3D printers. At this scale, there is not much physical stuff out there to buy, and the time limit would not permit much crafting. I would need people, bookshelves, tables, chairs, all that stuff. Now, have you ever tried to find STL files of regular, modern people just maybe sitting down, reading a book? Sculpts that do not include plasma guns or pointy ears? They're out there. But let's just say that people outside of wargaming and RPGs seem to have thicker wallets than we do. So I searched the internets for free modern civilian people and furniture sets. There's not much there, honestly. Things were looking a little scarce, somewhat like the amount of songs in my very first Winamp playlist. Anyway, I built a little framework out of cardboard to give me a sense of space and sketched out a very rough maximum impact blueprint. There is no way I can build a replica, but I can go for some resemblance and hopefully, Daddy, can you lift me up? I want to look at the little people in the little library effect. I test printed my way to a relatively correct scale, also not. I kind of see this as a little stage, theatrics and symbolics. First impact and not everlasting reality. My printers then ran hot, a huge time saver. I could just let the printers run during the week while working on other things. And in the end, I had 13 library visitors and about as many chairs and other little details resin printed on my lovely Frozen Sonic Mini 8K. Tables and bookshelves and that were printed on the great Anycubic Viper filament printer. The biggest thing for this entire project would be planning. There would be no time to wait for paint to dry. And there would be no time to accidentally realize I've been painting the one book for two hours. So I planned. Trying to minimize repetitional steps and to always have parallel things to work on. Dividing the two days worth of time into blocks of time during a four day period. Leaving holes for drying times and such. I also organized. 
I figured it would take less time to bring forth everything I thought I might need and have it in front of me, rather than waste time constantly trying to find the stuff I probably wouldn't need. First off was of course the miniature people whom I could paint before I got the actual box. Now I usually spend, I don't know, a day to paint the one miniature? 13 in less than half a day. I've got to be honest, is quite the challenge for me. I figured my best approach would be to Zenithal Prime and then cover with transparent paints. Hopefully it will give me a little sense of depth and contrast. I bought these Montana water-based odorless rattle cans and, well, for miniature work I can't really recommend them. Even after changing to a more precise cap, what comes out is thick and splattery, especially the white. My Zenithal Prime was more of a Zenithal Meteor Storm. I guess for fully covering coats on something like terrain, they, they could be handy. I mean, these are still rattle cans. There will be gas and paint dust, but there definitely was no smell. Because I'm working indoors here, that is rather important. I'm constantly wearing a respirator and spraying into my spray booth, but if this would have been regular rattle cans, I would have had to endure the smell of rattle can for days, probably. Beware, these paints take a long time to dry. Kinda wish someone had told me that. Green Stuff World sent me these intense inks, and I figured these would be great as transparents over the Zenithal Prime. Especially since there's so many different colours to choose from. Only while drying, they cracked. Convinced that I had not waited long enough for the rattle can paint to dry, I had myself to blame, but I really could not stop working. So I tried some inks from Scale Colour and had no cracking issues there. And so inks it was. Also, the transparent paints from Golden seemed to have no cracking issues either. I stumbled on a pretty nice variable skin tone mixture using yellow iron oxide, red iron oxide, burnt umber and white ink. Two layers of the first mixture gave a nice Caucasian skin tone. Adding more burnt umber ink gave a slightly darker shade and finally adding some black ink gave me even darker shades. Still feeling I could do with some more separation, I brought forth some of the instant paints from Scale Color like rather thin contrast paints, and used them sort of like washes. This also gave me the ability to slightly change the appearance of individual colours. If I used the same blue on a lot of miniatures, I could alter them slightly in different directions to make them more individual. I dry brushed everything with the same colour, going for a light tan slash khaki. It should work on all the skin, but also give the rather strong colours a bit more of a regular, worn look. I figured I had two selling points here. One is just bright colours. Some kid is going to look at these for like one minute and I want to tickle their colour receptive synapses. For the older crowd I figured my only accomplishable selling point would be a slight sense of space. That we can sort of fool the eye a bit. That these folk are inside a library and light is coming from the lamps up in the ceiling. So I took out my airbrush and sprayed the miniatures with a transparent grey from underneath, like a reversed Zenithal Prime, making them look more vibrant, bright up top and shaded further down. While my airbrush was out, I figured I'd airbrush some black ink onto the chairs I'd primed at the same time as the miniature people. Only now the ink did not work at all. It just puddled up. Not at all adhering to the surface. Funny that. And so I sprayed on some contrast paint instead, only to realise that does not give any sort of contrast effect at all. Instead, the chairs were now black again. Wish someone had told me that. And so I then airbrushed them again with a light grey colour. Effective, that. After cleaning up the clog in my airbrush, I tried to work up a dark wood feel on these tables, going from light browns to darker red browns to burnt umber ink, and finally some excessive black shading on the table legs. Again hoping to mimic a sense of space and light in the simplest of ways. This day would be the only time I could use oil paints, because of the curse of drying times. So I grabbed the moment and I brought out some indigo oil paint and mixed up a wash. Used to further enhance the shading on the miniatures, working in the oil wash mainly in the shaded areas. This did a subtle but nice job of shading but also tying all the different colours together. And that was the end of my first sitting. It was then time to go get the box. This could have been an epic reveal if it was not for the fact of this video's thumbnail. The lovely Stockholm Library in boxed miniature format. 
I could now finally get down to some serious business and, you know, hope that all my week's worth of printing would actually look nice and fit and all of that. After rattle can attacking all the areas I thought were going to be visible with the black, I went to work on the bookshelves. And lo and behold, the scale colour rings would now not stick to the Zenithal Prime surface. Wish someone would have told me that. Transparent paints from Golden to the rescue. I had no intention of painting every single spine of a book a different colour. Instead, I worked in blocks, or rows, if you may, sometimes indulging in the occasional half row. Now these books are way too large to be in scale, but this was the practical, time-based solution. Also, as mentioned before, I kind of see them as a theatrical backdrop, a symbolic thing rather than realism. Once more, I'm going for colours that will make the little kid's eyes go zing. The further I went, the more I indulged in smaller blocks of colour. Also trying to be smart by painting the one book here and there with multiple paints. Like a bit of red on a blue book makes purple book. A little yellow on a green book makes snot coloured book. You see where I'm going. After painting the bookshelves themselves with a dark brown colour, I brought forth some black wash from Vallejo. This stuff is real floaty and pretty dark. Pipetting in wherever I wanted darkness was pretty efficient. Same as with everything else, I shaded the lower halves of the shelves with transparent grey, and then the absolute bottom with a regular black. While the airbrush was out, I started working on some brown on the floor of the library. Whilst spilling out a bunch of paint from the cup, trying to wipe it up, I realised the wiping gave a pretty nice scratched and worn look. So I kept at it, spraying on paint and purposely scratching it with a piece of paper. I then varnished stuff with matte varnish. One thing is I don't like the glossy finish of a lot of the paints I used. Using a matte varnish on everything will make it all come together as one piece. But also, any protection this piece can get is probably good. It will be living outside. It will get wet and rained on. It will be touched by candy sticky fingers. I had been asked to put in this battery-driven lead strip so that at night light would shine out through the windows of the library hopefully luring in people to an unexpected read. And the actual library itself, the real library, has doors on every floor in between the bookshelves. Something I wanted to add to at least have some reassemblance of the real thing. So I needed to do a quick layout of the spacing of bookshelves to be able to fit doors and battery pack. I glued the bookshelves in place with white glue. As I've mentioned, this will be living outdoors and I would like it to not fall to pieces as soon as it steps out of my door. I'm trying to use robust glue and will stay away from super glue as temperatures outside can get pretty freezing and from what I know, super glue becomes brittle and can crack when frozen. Someone told me this, at least. I cut out the base sheets for the doors out of foam board that I then coated with Mod Podge to make them a little more robust and paintable. I do this on both sides. Foam board can skew when wet with paint, so adding the Mod Podge on both sides will make sure that it dries relatively flat. And that was the end of my second sitting. On the final day I started working on the doors, using strips of filament to, well, make it sort of look like the doors in the library. When one prints on a filament printer, it's pretty common to print a brim that makes sure the entire print sticks better to the printer's bed. These strips I used are all from the brims of the tables and bookcases I printed earlier. I had also, in hindsight, overnight, resin printed a few door handles, and also a clock that we will get to. These door handles are once more kind of oversized for the people in the library, but fits the scale of the bookshelves. If it's the scale of my backdrop. This time I'm priming with my airbrush, a Zenithal Prime. This primer just dries a lot faster than the rattle can stuff. Getting the hang of this now. While waiting for that to dry, I painted up the little details, computers and screens with black contrast paint and then spent quite a little while painting up the little stacks of books with instant paints from Scale Color. I figured, for one, these are the best detailed pieces so far, so the contrast effect actually works, but also they are kind of the center of attention together with all the people. The clock was way too flat and big to work well with contrast style paint, and I kind of wanted a fast, rustic surface, so I used a sponge to dab out the paint, resulting in a relatively eye-catching result. On the doors I used a large, pretty stiff bristled brush with transparent paint to mimic wood grain. I was starting to feel more and more at home in this world of trying to create fast textures and effects with simple means. Kind of rolling my thumbs a bit, I mean, the closer to the end I got, the more I had to wait for things to dry. 
I was sitting there looking at the bookshelves and felt that they were just a little flat and kind of very vibrant. So I went in and dry brushed everything with the tan color, lifting everything just a little bit. And yeah, I should get some craft paints one day. I gave the doors a final wood grain effect layer with burnt amber ink, pretty pleased with that overall effect. And then a layer of gold on the doorknobs, as well as gold on the dial and numerals of the clock. The thing with the clock is that it's another little reminder of the real library. They have one in there, in the real library. Still thinking the floor was looking a little dull, a little textureless, I sponged on some diluted brown paint. I mean, I can't go for full realism here, but I can try. And now I really wanted things to start drying faster. Speaking of faster, we are now in hot glue territory. Things were going to have to be put together quite rapidly. Hot glue to the rescue. The little battery box I had previously at some point primed black and made a wood covering for. I also glued on magnets with three minute epoxy. I figured if someone at some point needs to change the batteries in this thing, well, magnets. Great little things, magnets. The lead strips and the clock were all set in place using hot glue. I think this is the one big thing that bugs me. If I would have had access to some frosted plastic sheets, it would have been so nice to have covered this lead strip with something that looked, well, less like a hot glued on lead strip. I could now do a more precise layout of tables and people and start gluing everything in. The miniatures were pinned from the very start. I mean, not only does this thing have to be able to handle transport, but also the most probably curious fingers. I used excessive amounts of three minute epoxy, getting puddles of glue underneath everything I glued in place. But I hope this means that things will actually stay in place. A much better option than the opposite. So far, everything I had done was just a series of steps I needed to execute in the right order to get done. And it was a lot of fun now to do this step and see everything come together. And yeah, the magnet thing works. I finished off with more matte varnish, especially on the shiny blobs of glue and the doors. And then it was done. And I actually had an hour to spare to take some photographs and look at the matte varnish drying. Might sound strange, but this is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. That my initial estimate of how long this would take in my planning was correct. I was not sweating in the middle of the night, accidentally ruining things. I was done, on time. The box was then picked up and on the following day delivered to its final destination, right next to the actual library itself. These hero libraries were apparently open, like, you know, ribbon cutting and all that, by different writers and politicians. The Swedish Minister of Culture being the one who was the first to open and lay her eyes on my little miniature library. Kinda cool. But deep inside, I'd like to show her one of my little toy soldiers and say, look, this is what I can do. What you see here is just two days of work. Hopefully she was a little bit blinded by that lead strip. So, I mean, I could not have done any of this if it was not for my miniature painting hobby. A rather cool realization. All that fussing about with plastic, ruining brushes, rolling dice. Not only fun in itself, and for me a very rewarding hobby, but as it turns out, I'm slowly learning a craft that can be used for more things than space marines. If we want, we can use that, even if it's just helping your friends kid out with some new furniture for a dollhouse or decorations around your house, or, you know, making art. I want to end with a big thanks to everyone who sculpted the free downloadable sculpts I used. The amount of tabs, the fast frenzy of my search, resulted in the fact that I did not record every single creator. I've tried to list all I can down below in the video description, but please, if you see something in this video that is yours and you're not credited, please let me know and I'll add you to the list. And you know, I've been painting a pretty large library here with expensive miniature paints, so please feel free to join my Patreon. Not only supporting me and the creations of videos like this, but I guess in the end supporting a lot of paint producers too. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Thank you.